So as we start a new section looking at conflict in the international system, I think a good place to start is just in the very general sense of why does war occur? So let's begin with sort of the, of the rational assumption that both realist theory and liberal theory sort of hold to, and that is that states are thinking through things, that the decisions that they make are the result of sort of a calculation about costs and benefits, and they choose policies generally that advance their self-interest, okay? Well, if that's the case, then war really ends up looking crazy or perhaps even irrational because the costs of war are incredibly massive. Um, and the destruction and the loss of human life and in the modern era, there's almost no way in which the outcome of a war, the benefits that you might possibly get from that war are going to even make up for a fraction of the costs involved. And so from just sort of a, a superficial glance at this, war doesn't seem to make sense on a cost benefit um, rational level, particularly considering that you can compromise in most situations and arrive at solutions between states where they make changes to policy or share resources and get part of what they want for essentially talking um, with no, none of those sort of massive costs. So given that the costs are so high um, and compromise is a much more efficient way of solving problems, why is it that we end up seeing states engage in war on a fairly regular basis? Political scientists have come up with a, a, a couple different explanations that might salvage this idea of states being rational and yet still allow for us to have war in the international system, right? And so there have been three different arguments that have been put forward by James Farron about conditions under which it might make sense for a rational state to engage in warfare. One of those is indivisibility, right? That, that if you think about the benefits that states are fighting over um, as sort of a, a a pie, normally you'd want to be able to negotiate and divide the pie in half and side can take their half or maybe one side gets a bigger half, I don't know. But if there's no way to actually divide up the benefits, divide up the spoils, divide up the pie, then you might find yourself in a situation where your choice is between fighting and getting everything or acquiescing and, and letting the whole pie go to somebody else. And there are situations where maybe this sort of works. And I think one place where we could see a dynamic that looks kind of like this would be over um, the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians, right? So one of the things that we know is that territorial conflicts are one of the most common types of conflicts in the international system. States get really keen about controlling territory, but territory is something that is divisible, right? You can draw a line on a map and figure out which side gets what. And so part of the fight between the Israelis and the Palestinians is what does the border look like on that map? Where's the Palestinian territory potentially gonna be? Where's Israel's territory gonna be? But it's also about the city of Jerusalem and the status of the city of Jerusalem, both Israel Israel and um, Palestine claim Jerusalem as the capital of their of their state, but it's also about one spot within Jerusalem, um, the Dome of the Rock, which sits atop the Temple Mount. So there's literally one spot within the city that is sacred to both Islam and Judaism, and it's not something that you can really divide up and share, right? And so at the end of the day, one side is probably gonna control the Dome of the Rock and the Temple Mount, and the other side's not. And so that might be a situation which you say, well, if, if it comes down to it, I can't cut a compromise because of the nature of this issue, maybe fighting makes sense. Okay, those situations are pretty rare, and they don't really explain why we can't just buy each other off, right? It should be possible to just write a check and pay for the cost of the Temple Mountain. Hopefully, that would, that would work, right? Um, other situations I think are probably a little bit more common are what we might describe as the commitment problem, right? This is where we can sit down and we can hammer out an agreement and figure out something that will work, and it will work today, and it will be seen as fair by everybody today. But as the future progresses, there's uncertainty. There's uncertainty in that there might be political upheaval in one or both countries, and leaders might come to power who no longer are so cooperative, no longer are so willing to hold to that agreement. Also, as the future changes, the balance of power can shift. And if today you come up with an agreement that seems equitable and both sides are okay with, but 10, 20, 30 years down the road, one of those sides has gained tremendously in power, if they return and revisit that issue, and say, no, 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 we're gonna renegotiate that now. The other side that's no longer in such a good position is potentially gonna be um, 
is, is going to lose out. And so there might be a temptation to fight now when the balance of power favors your side rather than wait for a future where it doesn't. And I think we can see examples of this um, in World War II where one of the, the strangest things um, to happen is that even though uh, Hitler knew that the, one of the big mistakes Germany made in World War I was fighting on both the East and Western fronts, um, he ends up rushing into a conflict that attacks his ally in the Soviet Union um, in what on the surface looks like, like a huge blunder. But if you think about it from the perspective of the long-term trajectory of Germany and of the Soviet Union, there was real concern for Hitler and, and maybe a real urgency to strike at the Soviet Union um, when he did. And if you think about it as Germany had sort of industrialized and maxed out and was at the height of its power, but the Soviet Union was going through a process of rapid industrialization. It had a massive population base, but in, historically it couldn't really mobilize that population. But as it industrialized, as, it, as its economy grew, it was going to be a much, much more formidable enemy in a decade or two decades. And indeed, it becomes a global superpower. Um, and so striking at the Soviet Union at that moment when it was perhaps inconvenient because the war in the West was still going on makes more sense um, from that perspective. So the commitment problem is, is a story that you could tell where maybe it makes sense to fight now. A third story we could tell is deterrence, right? And that while negotiation can work, negotiation can solve this particular problem, if I cut a deal here, it may set a precedent and may encourage others to maybe make demands, expecting that I'm going to negotiate. Um, and at some point I'm going to have to um, perhaps say no and it's gonna end up coming to blows. And so again, we can see maybe an example of this in that World War II experience where what ends up happening is when Hitler comes to power in Germany, he doesn't sort of declare to the world, ha ha, I'm gonna you know, conquer the whole of Europe. Instead, he begins by taking very simple steps, right? He de uh, demilitarized, remilitarizes the Rhineland, right? So he moves in military equipment into an area that he was supposed to keep demilitarized as part of the terms of the peace from World War I. And he's watching to see if France or Britain will tell him, no, get those tanks and artillery out of that region, you're violating the terms of the agreement. And they don't. And so then he moves on Austria and engineers a Anschluss or unification with Austria. And again, watching very closely, this is something that he wasn't supposed to do under the terms of the ending of World War I, and yet he's done it and did Germany or did uh, Britain or France challenge him? They didn't. And so then he moves on Czechoslovakia and says, oh, I just want part of Czechoslovakia. And Neville Chamberlain goes to Munich and meets with Hitler and gets an agreement that after that, that's it, Hitler's done, he's not taking any more. And Neville Chamberlain returns and says, no, I've got it to peace in our time. And Hitler takes the, uh, the Western part of Czechoslovakia and then rolls in and conquers the rest and then moves on Poland. And Germany and France say, if you invade Poland, that will be the last straw, it will be war. But at that point, Hitler has learned this lesson that Britain and France will not actually challenge him. And so those, those warnings, those threats that potentially could have stopped him from furthering his, his advance um, just are aren't heated. And so there's this idea that if you don't stand up on little things, they're going to spiral into big things. And actually there's considerable evidence of this in civil wars where we find that countries that have only one ethno-nationalist group um, or ethno-nationalist minority, countries like maybe Canada would be a good example with the Quebecois, um, when the Quebecois make demands for autonomy, when they make demands for greater political voice or accommodation, um, the larger Canadian government is more inclined to say, okay, we, we can cut you a deal. We can work with you. Um, whereas when states have multiple groups that are potentially going to make ethno-nationalist claims, seeking independence, seeking territory, seeking rewriting of the constitution for their benefit, um, states like perhaps India, where there's multiple different groups that have made um, claims for, for greater autonomy or independence, those states are more likely to fight and fight long and fight hard to suppress um, ethno-nationalist groups because we think if they offer a deal to one group, it's going to open up the whole the whole thing for every other group that's suddenly going to rise up and make demands that otherwise they might not have made. And so this could also be a story that makes sense, right? Deterrence is this particular conflict doesn't make sense in a cost-benefit analysis, but it's not this particular conflict. It's this one and this one and this one and this one. And when you add them all up, maybe it makes sense to fight now. Okay, we could think about that in, in terms of a uh, 
simple game theoretic analysis. I'm going to briefly run through this because I think it's worth introducing. Uh, this story about deterrence um, is oftentimes modeled as a game of chicken. A game of chicken is you probably something you've heard of before. It's that story about like two cars driving at each other, and the question is, are they going to you know crash into each other? Is one going to swerve? Are they both going to swerve? Well, this is essentially what we have with this two by two table, right? We have two players. They can make a choice. They can swerve, which is I guess accommodate or choose not to crash and die um, or they can go straight and if both sides swerve well then you know no crash happens everybody walks away but they both have to kind of hang their heads and be like oh I guess I swerved which I guess is embarrassing in the context of the story whereas if one side swerves and the other one goes straight right the one who went straight you know jumps out of their car and screams yeah I went straight and you swerved and there's bragging rights where the other side has to you know hang their head and if they're a chicken and so you know that's uncomfortable um, and you know, maybe you don't want that to happen every night. Um, but if you crash into each other, you know, you both die and in game theoretic terms, I guess we're going to represent that with a, a negative 10, uh, really bad outcome, something that's, that's horrible. Um, so the question is, if you develop a reputation as somebody who always swerves, then every single time when you play this game with somebody, they're gonna go straight just assuming that you're gonna swerve. And so the, the logic of deterrence is that sometimes it makes sense to actually go straight and have a crash so that you don't have that reputation of always swerving and that maybe makes people hesitant to try to take advantage of you. And so maybe they're more inclined to swerve and to accommodate because of the fear that you might actually crash into each other if you try to go, go straight. Okay, so it's just a, another way of thinking about this question of deterrence. There's a final possibility um, that potentially could al align with the idea that, that war is something that rational states end up doing, and that is that war is simply a mistake, right? That the people who are doing these cost-benefit calculations, who are analyzing the situation, are just screwing it up. And part of it could be that we're, we're miscalculating the costs um, of, of victory. And so there's actually some evidence for this, right? There's some evidence that the closer states are in terms of, of um, parity, the more likely they are to have disputes escalating to war. Whereas if the, the difference in terms of power is really great, then they're much less likely to have a crisis turn into a war because, well, that would be much more likely to be cataclysmic, whereas if you're at a situation of power parity, both sides could convince themselves potentially that they're gonna win, right? And wishful thinking certainly can feed into this, right? And so in, even in uh, 2003, when the United States went into Iraq, um, Paul Wolfowitz went before Congress, he was the Assistant Secretary of Defense, and testified that the war in Iraq would be really easy. You know, the US would be in and out probably within six weeks. He said it would cost $80 billion upfront for investment, but you know, don't worry about that, Congress. I know 80 billion sounds like a lot, but once Iraq's oil comes online, a grateful Iraqi population will simply pay the United States back for the cost of toppling Saddam Hussein. Well, that was an incredibly rosy scenario and for no uh, connection to the reality that was actually experienced by the US in Iraq, which involved thousands of US soldiers that died, hundreds of thousands of Iraqis that died over the course of multiple years to a total cost of around two trillion dollars. So wishful thinking can influence this process pretty seriously. It can also be that we misread the situation and that's something that can fit within this idea that, that war is still rational but maybe suggests that we're not really that good at analyzing and navigating these situations, right? So you could end up in a situation where an adversary or a potential adversary makes a very reasonable demand, right? But given the logic of deterrence, you might be thinking, aha, this could be an op this could be a, a, a test, right? This could be Hitler moving into the Rhineland to see what my reaction will be. And if I accommodate, if I say, yeah, that's actually a very reasonable demand, go ahead and do that or I'll help you out with that, then they're gonna make another demand after that and another one after that because they've learned the lesson that you're willing to accommodate them. Whereas if you stand firm and confront them and fight a war, over that reasonable demand, they will learn not to make unreasonable demands down the line. Um, so you can end up finding yourself responding in a much more aggressive way than maybe the situation responds. And even if it doesn't escalate to war in that one instance, what ends up happening is that the country that made the reasonable demand said, what is going on here? I made a very reasonable request. I had this issue, I explained it, I put it forward. Why won't you work with me? Oh no they conclude, you don't want me to have my problems addressed, my concerns resolved, my situation in the international system improved because 
you are out to get me. And that, that confrontation rather than accommodation can sort of raise the alarm bells for another state. And suddenly somebody who is maybe an adversary or a rival can turn into an enemy because of that process of not being able or willing to accommodate because of that desire to set a strong signal in terms of deterrence, right? And so we see this, this dynamic playing out during the Cold War. It's a dynamic that we've seen play out with arms races where states are going back and forth and, and mobilizing and unwilling to trust each other and unwilling to accommodate each other and actually making the tension between them escalate as a result of, of those dynamics.